Good morning and welcome to my father's place. I have a message that the Lord laid on my heart in midweek. I'm going to pray and then we'll talk about it. And the question is, wretched or free? Wretched or free? Father, I thank you. It's not your desire that we be wretched. It's not your desire that we should be struggling. It's not your desire that we should be slaves to sin. May we see it today. May we believe it today. Jesus, you are the author and the finisher of my faith and of each one of us. Finish the faith of those who have been deceived, I pray. Holy Spirit, have your way with this truth in Jesus' name. Amen. I give honor to God first. And I give honor to my husband, Jeff, who is a great man of God, that by God's doing, and who is also my videographer. And I thank God today. I have to just pause and thank him because I fell on Wednesday on some slippery wood on a walkway and uh, bruised my rib. And yesterday, all day, I was sore. But Jeff laid hands on my rib, and prayed the prayer of faith. And today, I'm perfectly fine. I have no pain whatsoever. I'm not on any kind of medication or anything like that. Jesus Christ, beloved, is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is still doing not only miracles like this, but the miracle of a changed heart. Hallelujah. I just give him praise. Hallelujah. So my text is from Romans 7. And the question is, wretched or free? Which does God want us to be? Wretched or free? Sounds ridiculous. Why would he want us to be wretched? Let's look at it. Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Does God want us to be sold into bondage to sin? And then, in verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Listen, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Does God want us to continue practicing evil? Wretched man that I am, verse 24. Does God want us to remain wretched? Who will set me free from the body of this death, from this principle of sin, from this nature of sin that's within me? Who will set me free? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise be to God. God's desire is not that we be in bondage to sin. God's desire is not that we practice evil. God's desire is not that we remain in a wretched condition. God's desire is that we be set free through Jesus Christ our Lord. Many have said, this is Paul who writes this, and therefore this is Paul's current condition. Beloved, I'll tell you what. Satan loves to twist the scripture, and he'll whisper his twisted scripture into any ear that will hear. And he twists this scripture on a regular basis because I hear this throughout the body of Christ. What I want to do, I don't want to do, but the very thing I don't want to do, that's the thing I do. All the time, said glibly and with a smile. That isn't what God's saying. If Paul was still in this condition when he was going about as an evangelist and an apostle, if he was still in that condition, he would not be able to do that work. He'd be wretched. He'd be wrestling. He'd be in bondage. 
he is not in bondage. This is um, a technique that rabbis use. And him being a former Pharisee, it's the technique he's using here. He's using this technique for the Jewish folks who have converted to Christianity in the church at Rome. And so when he's speaking this, it is a method of teaching used by rabbis where you present a circumstance where I, whoever that may be, I am in a terrible state. I am wretched. I am sold into bondage to sin. I do evil. That is not Paul now. But that is the former position he was in. That is the former position I was in and Jeff was in and all Christians are in until, but I get ahead of myself. Sold into bondage to sin. What kind of God would we have? What kind of salvation do we have if we're stuck, sold into bondage forever? What kind of salvation do we have? Beloved, I ask you that in love. Because this which Satan has twisted comes from the very depths of his lair where he is trying to convince people that what God says he will do, God cannot do. Did God really say? This is his technique. And he has used it very effectively in entire denominations and I hear it even in the denominations that claim to teach that God can make a heart holy, pure. If we are holy and pure, we are no longer sold into bondage to sin. If we are holy and pure, we no longer do evil instead of the good that we want to do. The Lord has made it so that we can walk about on this earth as the witnesses of Jesus Christ with not an evil bone in our bodies. That's what we're talking about here. Evil. Bondage. That is not Paul's current state. It should not in any way, shape, or manner be the current state of any Christian why do I say that is not his current state? What is his current state? Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Thanks be to God, who will set me free from this body of sin? Well, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, I am crucified. I am crucified. I no longer live that way. I no longer look at people and judge, judge, judge. I look at people and say, come, come, come. Beloved, free is his present condition because of Jesus Christ. He makes it clear, Jesus does. In John 8, 31, go there with me. I want us to understand what context, that is from what position he is saying, when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Here is the context, starting in verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And some answered him and said, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits Sin is the slave of sin, sold into bondage to sin, Romans 7. 
sold into bondage to sin. Everyone who commits sin is a slave of it. And beloved, this is a reminder to us and a warning to us in verse 35, the slave, the slave to sin. That's the context. Does not remain in the house forever. But the son does remain forever. The son being the one who has been set free by Jesus Christ from this bondage, from doing evil, from being wretched. God doesn't want us to be wretched. And that's what the man in Romans 7 is. Glory to God. He doesn't want us to remain that way. He wants us to be free. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son, the one who is set free from bondage to sin, from slavery to it, he remains forever. <laughs> Glory to God. So, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Or, as it says in the original Greek, translated and put in the right context as far as order of words, then... If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So then, if he sets you free, you are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer in bondage to sin. You are no longer committing evil. You are no longer wretched, which means miserable. Now, the church at Laodicea was miserable. Go over to Revelation this lukewarm church that was half in the world and half in the church the one he was ready to vomit from his mouth why? verse 17 because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing that describes the church in the U.S. Rich, wealthy, in need of nothing. We are wildly rich compared to third world countries or underdeveloped countries, as we say to be politically correct today. I am wealthy, need of, in need of nothing. I am rich. And he says, and you do not know that you are wretched, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He tells this church in Laodicea, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, and he advises them to buy gold. He advises them to be purified, is what that really means. He advises them to have his baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, which will purify just as gold is purified. He is the refiner. Glory to God. I am so glad that I don't have to be wretched and blind and miserable and poor and naked. Glory to God. I'm free in Christ, not free to sin away my life, but free from sin, glory. It no longer has power over me. That's what this great glorious thing is all about, beloved. And the devil has us fooled. He has twisted that scripture. Oh, but you must remain wretched. That's exactly what Romans 7 says. If people say that's the way, just the way we are, can't help it, we're wretched. No! Glory to God, I'm here to announce. I'm here to shout from the rooftops that that is not true. That is just absolutely not true. What God, what kind of God do we serve if he would want us to remain wretched? We serve a good God who sent his very son as the means by which our past sins would be forgiven and then he would take us into this purity of heart by the baptism with the Holy Ghost and fire so that we can live this life, so that we can be his witnesses here. Glory. This is good news. 
The other stuff comes out of the very pit of hell and it needs to go right back where it came from, beloved. You have been deceived. And I pray you see it today. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We'll go back to Romans 6. Some of the people in Rome, in the church in Rome, were saying, well, God's grace is here, so I can sin. And his grace will increase. The more I sin, the more his grace will increase. So what did he say? In, verse, in chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. Who shall deliver me from my wretchedness? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Now this is how you get to that point where God purifies you, where you are. His witness, the witness of Jesus Christ, the witness that every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ. You don't get it by having three Bentleys in the yard. It's by having a pure heart. This is, this is how shall we who have died to sin? There's a death that must occur. When you are baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, all that is not of God that is in you dies. Verse 3, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We're not talking about the baptism of repentance here. This is another twisting of scripture by the enemy. There's no other place where you can make this match up and say, well, they're talking about just baptism in water, baptism of repentance. I give my life to you, Lord. No, this is the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus came to do. John says, I came to baptize in water for repentance, but there's one greater than me who's coming who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's the baptism we're talking about here. Oh, my goodness. And we look down, verse 7. Oh, this is such good news. For he who has died is freed from sin. Glory to God. 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Oh, my God. I mean, think about it. Think about it. He says, you are freed from sin. Verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, oh yes, to his righteousness, you, you gladly say, oh Lord, you have put your righteousness in me. And I live by that, not the old sin principle, not the old sin nature that was in me. Glory to God. The outcome is sanctification and eternal life, beloved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First Peter died to sin. First Peter, does, he, does Peter agree with Paul and with God? First Peter 2, 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. You can use that scripture from Isaiah 53 for healing. God used it to convince me. But the real healing that's being talked about in Isaiah 53, which is quoted by Peter here, is the healing of our relationship with God. We are separated from God by sin. The healing comes when the death comes, when we die to sin, when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire and all the sin in us is burned out. Glory to God. Oh, it's a great, it's a great gospel. But the enemy has taken it and twisted it just a little bit. So we have an excuse for our sin. Beloved, 
I say this with all the love in my heart. I used to, before, I used to look for excuses for my sin. Before. Formerly, I did evil. Formerly, I was a slave to sin. I was in bondage to it. Formerly, in the past, before, before the fire. And after the fire, I was set free. My conscience is as clear as what Paul said his was when he was being questioned by the Corinthians. When his apostleship was being questioned by them. He said, my conscience is clear. And so is mine. By God's doing, not anything I could do on my own. But I die and he lives. Glory to God. Oh my goodness. Look at Galatians 5. Now we know... 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and spirit control. And we know the deeds of the flesh. In verse 19, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, that is hostilities toward one another, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, heresies, Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, says Paul, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived by the devil into thinking that you are supposed to remain wretched in bondage to sin, doing evil. It's not true. He is a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44, and there is not a speck of truth in him. When he speaks a lie, it is his native language. But the church has fallen for it. It's easy believism. You don't have to change a thing about yourself. You can go on just being what you are. God's grace will cover you Thanks be to God for the blood of Jesus. Now, I thank God for the blood of Jesus because I might offend somebody without even knowing it. Technically, that's sin, but it's not anything I intentionally did. And the blood and the grace of God covers me for those things. That's still, I don't say that I don't need Christ's blood. That's what got me to this point. But I do say, we go past that. There is babyhood, there is infancy, and there is death. And life in him, free from bondage. Hallelujah. So, death. Galatians 5.24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, oh, what have we died to? Have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Glory to God. Then, beloved, another misused scripture, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we say, well, we're sinning, but there's no condemnation for us. When Jesus speaks to the church of Laodicea and five out of the seven church that he writes to, he tells them they must repent or what they have will be taken away from them. That's pretty scary. That's a warning from him to them and to you. What does it say in Hebrews 10? If you keep on sinning after coming to the knowledge of the truth, it says, if you are trampling on the blood which was shed 
on that cross for you. Beloved, do not fall into Satan's clever schemes. You look, you be like the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, and you look to see, you examine the scriptures to see if what I say is true. You go to Ezekiel 36 and tell me that God does not promise to change our hearts so we obey out of love. Tell me that Jesus Christ doesn't pray in John 17 for everyone to have us and the very love of God in our hearts. God's actual love. Tell me he doesn't say that. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. But here's the question. Will you believe it? It's right there in black and white. And if you have a red letter Bible for all the words of Jesus, it's also in red. It is a lie that you have to remain a slave to sin. It is a lie that you must remain wretched. Will you believe the truth that Jesus Christ will set you free indeed? If your heart has been moved by this message, get on your knees, bow your heart right now to him and ask him to do it. Ask him to do it. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And beloved, that's not just speaking in tongues. That's an entire change, an entire purification, an entire giving over of all, all, all of you, even your heart, to your God. That's what happens when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. So ask him to do it. If you believe... He will. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for revealing it to me and Jeff and others who have been given. Praise be to God. Even our pastor at Massey Memorial Church of God in Christ testifies just last week that his heart was purified and God cleaned house on him when he was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, that the denomination still says they believe that. I pray that many, many individuals in churches all around this nation would hear your word and believe you and then walk it out and watch it come to be. Jesus, this was your purpose. You are the one who delivers us from wretchedness. I praise your holy name. Holy Spirit, have your way in hearts with this word which you have given me to speak. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.